All right, everyone, it's time for us to begin class, the last class of our quarter. Uh, we've been studying the book of Philippians, and uh, I, for one, have enjoyed the study very much. I hope it's benefited you in some way. We're going to uh, finish with verses 10 through 23, verses 10 through 23. I want to commend Daniel on his sermon. It's very well done, and there's a whole lot about that sermon that fits uh, the end of uh, chapter 4 here very well. Uh, and so uh, I commend that, that uh, sermon to you. It's a wonderful thing about, uh, you know, technology today. We can go back and not only listen uh, to what's presented, but we can also see uh, the, uh, the gospel preacher as he preaches that sermon. All right, I want us to read uh, 14. Uh, through 23, 14 through 23. This is taken from the NIV translation. Yet it was good of you to share in my troubles. Moreover, as you Philippians know, in the early days of your acquaintance with the gospel, when I set out from Macedonia, not one church shared with me in the matter of giving and receiving, except only you. For even when I was in Thessalonica, you sent me aid more than once when I was in need. Not that I desire your gifts. What I desire is that more be credited to your account. I have received full payment and have more than enough. I am amply supplied. Now that I have received from uh, Epaphroditus the gifts you sent, they are a fragrant offering, an acceptable sacrifice, pleasing to God. And my God will meet all your needs according to the riches of his glory in Christ Jesus. To our God and Father be glory forever and ever. Amen. And then the final greetings. Greet all God's people in Christ Jesus. The brothers and sisters who are with me send greetings. All God's people here send your greetings, especially those who belong to Caesar's household. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with you, with your spirit. Amen. Okay, what I want to do is, is I'm going to go through the first six questions that I've prepared, and then we're going to take um, a, a short sabbatical from that, and uh, I'm going to make a, four points to you, and then we'll pick up uh, with our, our questions af after that. What are some of the ways that we can share in the problems and troubles of others, specifically uh, our brethren and the issues that they have to face? Uh, day in and day out, uh, sicknesses, financial issues, uh, problems with family, on and on and on are the things that we have to deal with. But not only our brethren, but also those who we know from outside the faith. What are some of the ways that we can share in the troubles? Remember I said share in the problems and the troubles of others. You ever thought about that? Is it your responsibility to share in other people's troubles and sorrows and pains and afflictions? Is it your uh, obligation as a Christian to involve yourself in that kind of a nightmare? Do you do that? Your time, your finances, what you physically can do, what you emotion, the emotional help that you can give. Look, I've learned something in my life. You can own the world. And Jesus talked about this. What does it profit a man? If he gains the whole world and loses his own soul. You can own the whole world, but be poor for the lack of love. You can own nothing and be wealthy in relationships. I'll take the latter. With more money comes what? More pain. In the final analysis, I'll tell you. Brian? In context with what we talked about last week in the Lord's Supper about fellowship, which is a sharing in and a participation in, there's so many other things that could have been said, but for example, we share in or participate in the sufferings of Christ. We have fellowship with one another, therefore we share in and participate in and bear the burdens of our fellow brothers and sisters in Christ through the ways that you've have identified up there to be present, to pray, to have empathy, sympathy, and uh, tangible participation. 
do unto others as you would, <coughs> would have them do unto you. I believe that's the golden rule, right? Uh, by talking, one of the things that I, I love about what Caitlin does in her service, uh, her, her independent personal service to others in the congregation where she now belongs over at Southside, is she spends a lot of time with the elderly there. And what she does, she goes over there and talks to them. Now, one of them is an Alzheimer's patient, so she's talking to somebody who's really not making a whole lot of sense, but she's still talking to that person, and it calms her. Calms Caitlin, too, but it calms this woman. We, we talk to one another. Sometimes just talking uh, is, is very important, but sometimes just keeping your mouth shut and being silent, sitting there, hold her hand is an important thing. I remember one day I was up here crying like a baby over, uh, a, I don't know if y'all remember or not, uh, but one of Ashlyn and Caitlin's very dear friends from school, Chelsea, uh, had been diagnosed at that time with, with a lymphoma and uh, she was carrying a baby. And I mean, I just, uh, I just lost it up here. Because I, I know, I've known the young lady, uh, sweet as she can be. Now everything's okay. <laughs> Uh, God's blessed her and healed her, and she's had the baby, and the baby's beautiful and perfect, and it's just a wonderful thing. But me up here, I, I lost it like a big old goof, and uh, I walk down there, and what's the first thing? My wife is back off there in the back somewhere. I don't know where Muffy was, but she finally came around and looked at me, and she says, ooh, ooh, something is not right, you know? So before she could get down here, Albert came down here and sat down by me. And uh, Albert puts off a lot of heat, Albert, okay? And it was very warm and congenial and kind and loving and thoughtful. He gave me a hug. Ain't nothing better than a hug every now and then. Talking, hugging, thanking, listening. Okay, that's the thing that we've lost a lot with this COVID mess. All right, we've lost a lot of that. And what I loved about Thanksgiving was is that all our family didn't care, you know. I mean, we all came together and we was hugging and kissing and every other kind of thing. Okay, we were having a good time. And it was wonderful for me to have that kind of association that we had taken for granted. So what are some of the ways that we can share in the problems and troubles of others? Well, here they are. At least that's the way I see it, okay? Number two, what were the giving habits of the Philippians? Now remember, Paul is writing a letter to them. All right? What, 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 what was he pointing out to them that, that's so fantastic? If you have to understand how long it was that these Philippian brethren even knew him. Okay? That church at Philippi helped him. It was the only church. Not Iconium, not Lystra, not Derby, not Thessalonica, not Berea. None of them offered him any financial help. None of them offered him those things that he needed at that time. Now, true, Paul was a tent maker. And I think all gospel preachers need to be making tents, personally. I think it should have always been that way. That's just me. I think that's important. And I tell young men now who come to me as gospel preachers and talk to me about that uh, type of thing, I tell them how important it is to emulate Paul. We talk about the reasons for that. But those other churches, they, they didn't, and the facts are, this church in Philippi loved Paul. And I'm telling you guys, it was only after several weeks that they had known him. Remember, they traveled through Amphipolis and Apollonia, and they came to Thessalonica, and Paul was there for three weeks. But in that time, the church in Philippi sent at least two financial gifts to help Paul in his ministry. You can look back at verse 16. So he goes there, and in that time that he had, had spent with Philippi, as he left on his travels, it only took that several weeks in order for the apostle to already see the love and the care uh, that the church in Philippi. Uh, and I'll tell you, the church here at Bel Air, very much the same way until we started into a building program, which is very needed. This church 
you have no idea the amount of financial support that it gave preachers all over the world. How long, Mike? 20 years, 30 years, 40 years? This church was known for that. And probably a lot went undone because of the money financially that was sent. And the brethren around here in Houston, Texas, they don't know anything about that. And wasn't that a beautiful thing? We just did it. And so it, it, it hurts me a little bit to know that, you know, we've had to stop that. But we've had to stop it to take care of our congregation and this building falling down around us. Okay? So a very important thing, and I think we've been, we've dealt, been dealt with very well in that regard. The Lord's blessed us. But the church at Philippi was a giving church. And we need to be a giving church, not just financially, but to each other. And you've got to do that because you want to. Yeah, Brother Broadwell. And uh, on top of all of that, 2 Corinthians 8 says that the brethren in Macedonia, likely including the Philippians, uh, gave out of their poverty. So Paul seems to indicate that a church like Philippi didn't have very many financial resources and yet they were still willing to give what they had, uh, maybe like a widow's mite situation. Absolutely, and a point well taken, okay? A point well taken. Which, by the way, nothing says that we individually can't give, right? As individuals. Most of us have plenty. We have a lot. And if you don't have a lot of money, I'm sure, you know, you can cook or you can clean, or you can do whatever it is that would be of service to others. And remember that, that that, that, that defines Jesus, is service. And we want to, of course, reflect him. What does Paul mean when he says, I do not desire your gifts, but that more be credited to your account? I love this. What, what, what is Paul talking about this more to be credited? Did, did he covet their gifts? Did he need their gifts? Well, you could say that he needed those gifts, but did he really need the gifts? Yes, sir. Brian, Brian. Well, there's so many uh, instructions and counsel from Christ himself on this. I would go to Matthew 25 and the judgment scene uh, where those who entered into the kingdom sacrificed themselves on behalf of others. And that's what Paul's talking about here, spiritual wealth, the heavenly riches rather than physical riches. Yes, he um, was comforted by his needs being met, but his primary motive was the fact that vir by virtue of the fact that they gave to him, they were accumulating for themselves heavenly wealth. That's exactly right. So he was benefited, just like Brian said. He was benefited by their financial support, their contribution. And certainly it helped meet his needs, whatever his needs were. I will tell you that that gift was from God. Because that's the only way that the Philippians could have had the money, number one, and could have had the, the knowledge of how to properly use that money. It came from, that's the reason why whenever we contribute to the Lord's work, that it is so important that we do with those finances what we've been given authority to do. But of course he was benefited and the gift was wonderful, but that was not his primary concern. What was his primary concern? They were. And that's the same with us as far uh, as it goes with Jehovah our God. He's concerned about what? He's concerned about their spiritual well-being. Okay? It wasn't about how he would be profited himself. But how it is that they would be profited by doing what they did. Spiritually. Good point. Thank you, Brian. What good comes to the giver? If you do much giving at all, you recognize right quick that you benefit greatly from that. How? 
What good comes to the giver? Spiritual gain. That's what he's talking about, being credited to you. Spiritual gain. The spiritual good to be credited to your account. Not some physical advantage to yourself. That's not what this is about. What's credited to you is the spiritual benefit. Okay, a profitable investment in the service of God, for God will repay them rich dividends by adding interest to their account. Do you want the Lord to add interest to your account? You take your money and you invest that at the bank and you want good interest or you want to make money on your investment, right? You don't take your money and dig a hole and bury it in the ground, do you? Hmm, Sounds like to me there might be a lesson in that. But what do you do with it? You take your talent and you do what? You work that talent that's been given to you by God. So these dividends are future rewards. Maybe at the coming of the Lord. But I think in terms of our spiritual growth, in terms of our character and the growth of our character, this is what happens when we engage in good works. We benefit from that. And not only that, but by the way you feel. The way you feel about yourself. It just makes you feel good. Not to have a whole bunch of money uh, per se, if you can help somebody humbly, that's fine. But a lot of it has to do the, this feeling with what you're able to accomplish and how you're able to help that one who's in need overcome that issue. Yeah. Um, I'm, I was thinking along the same lines with the, the feeling. Um, I was... There's a lot of times, I guess, in everybody's life where you think about doing good things and then you, you don't do them because you just, for whatever reason, you put it off. Or, and then you, you, that, there's two things that I've noticed that come about for me in those situations. The one is I feel like worry about wanting to do it but then not doing it. So there's like this, I don't know, almost an anxiety when you don't. And then there's the regret if you miss that opportunity. It, past, you know, those two things, you know, eat away at you. And then the the selfishness you feel if you didn't do, you didn't give, you know, um, that eats away at you. But then on the other side, when you, when you actually follow through and you actually do it, um, you know, the goodness you feel that you did that for someone else or that you reflected Christ within yourself, you know, and you, you, you know, you don't, you for me, it's kind of like a release of all the, of the burden, you know, the things I was wanting to do. Oh, I did it. I don't, you know, I'm kind of reminded of maybe what James wrote in chapter four, verse 17, when you know the right thing to do and fail to do it for that person, it it is sin. And, you know, I mean, we have a lot of opportunities to give, but you know, when you know you want to do that and then you don't, it really troubles you. Let let me just say something to that. You're exactly right, Michael. But let's talk about the opposite side of that. Brethren, we need to learn how to receive. There's a whole lot of us don't know how to receive. You got your brethren over here trying to live up to what it is that the Savior, God Almighty, wants us to do with each other as family. And we have difficulty accepting those gifts. Shame on us. We've got to learn how to receive. Yes, sir, Brian. Um, so many verses to think about here, but I think of Acts 3.19. Repent, therefore, and return that your sins may be wiped away. And here's the important part. In order for times of refreshing to come from the presence of the Lord. I think sometimes we only go halfway. We strive to turn away from unrighteousness, but we don't embrace righteousness. Do the good things and you will leave discouragement behind. You will be strengthened. And I'll go back to Matthew 25, the judgment scene. 
those who were condemned were not condemned. They will be, but they were not condemned in that particular account that Jesus gave us because of their immoralities and, and unrighteousness that they committed. They were condemned for not doing the righteous deeds. And those who entered into the kingdom were commended for their righteous deeds, not so much on how they were so strong to uh, uh, reject uh, temptation. Absolutely and well said. You know, I've, I've given you guys the illustration about the football coach that, uh, that you know, came, came up to me that day after I made one of very few really good tackles. And uh, walked up there, you know, and he grabbed my helmet and shook my helmet and said, Steve, he said, you just need to hit somebody like that. Just hit somebody and something good's going to happen. Okay, and the point of that is, is that you've got to hit somebody. You have to make it your business to do something, righteousness, right doing, okay? So I think his, uh, Brian's point is, is well taken. Thank you for the comments. I wonder if we can get a woman to say something here in just a minute. I would love to hear from our women. We seldom hear from them. What gift gets praise or scorn by God? Now look, I just want to read these to you. What gift gets praise? praise or scorn by God. The Lord detests the sacrifice of the wicked, but the prayer of the upright pleases him. We've been talking about Proverbs in Daniel's class on Wednesday night. And I just think that this is interesting. He detests the sacrifice of the wicked, but prayer pleases him. Look at this. When you offer Malachi, y'all know this, uh, chapter 1, verse 8. When you offer blind animals for sacrifice, is that not wrong? When you sacrifice lame and, and uh, deceased animals, is that not wrong? Try offering them to your governor. Would he be pleased with you? Would he accept you, says the Lord Almighty? Would he accept that, that gift? Isaiah chapter 1, verses 10 through 17. We also studied that in Daniel's class. Uh, Isaiah 1, if y'all want to flip over there right quick, I think we can read this. I think it's important. Hear the word of the Lord, you rulers of Sodom. Give ear to the teaching of our, of our God, you people of Gomorrah. What to me is the multitude of your sacrifices, says the Lord. I have had enough burnt offerings of rams and the fat of well-fed beasts. I do not delight in the blood of bulls and of lambs or of goat. When you come to appear before me, who has required of you this, this trampling of my courts. Bring no more vain offerings. Incense is an abomination to me. New moon and Sabbath and the calling of convocations. I cannot endure iniquity in solemn assembly. Your new moons and your appointed feasts, my soul hates. They have become a burden to me. I am weary of bearing them. And when you spread out your hands, I will hide my eyes. From you, Even though you make many prayers, I will not listen. Your hands are full of blood. Wash yourself. Make yourself clean. Remove the evil of your deeds from before my eyes. Cease to do evil. Learn to do good. Seek justice. Correct oppression. Bring justice to the fatherless. Plead the widow's cause. Listen to that. Listen to what he says there. It's incredible. He says, wash yourselves. Make yourself clean. Remove the evil of your deeds. Learn to do good. You want God Almighty to, to, uh, uh, to praise you, to be excited about his child, to want to, to exclaim you're doing? Learn to do good. Seek justice. Correct oppression. Bring justice to the fatherless. What, what is it that the Bible says about the fatherless and, and the, the widows in their affliction? What, what does it say about that? You got to visit them. You got to visit them. Okay. There's no way that you can visit somebody if you don't visit them. Well, I guess you can use uh, uh, the computer. I guess you could do that. That's not very warm, but in this, these days and times, of course, if you're going to visit the elderly, elderly, you don't want to take a chance to, to cause them to become ill. That's not your goal. But you got to visit them, okay? I just thought that was good. 
Don't, don't say you're a Christian off of your blind animals. Your discarded animals. Go ahead. Steve, your points are, are greatly taken, and I just share that it's a maturity that you, that you go through, and it's a maturity that, that I've personally had to go through, like I, I attempted in last week when talking about giving of our financial means. I've had to grow and develop my maturity. Is it a priority? Am I thinking ahead? Have I planned accordingly for my giving, or is it, okay, what's left over? Um, in giving of, uh, to my brothers and sisters, is it that I think of giving beforehand, or am I sharing what I have in abundance? And so it's a journey, it's a path, and, and to the younger couples and the younger kids, you know, continue to strive for it, and it'll click, and it'll come in, and just keep going with it. Right. Let me tell you something about giving. We'll touch on it here again in just a minute. You give a whole lot better when you really trust God. When you really trust God and you believe with all your heart that what you got has been given to you by him, all of what you have has been given by him. I mean, he takes care of the birds of the field, doesn't he? The least birds of the field. Don't think he won't continue to take care of you. I think it's important we understand that. What is promised to those that give with a proper attitude? And a proper attitude is very important. It talks about fruit, okay? This idea of fruit, it's interest added to the account of the Philippians as a result of their gifts, okay? And I told you before, Paul has the spiritual in mind here. The spiritual good being credited to their account as a result of these gifts, not the advantage to himself. What I'm trying to tell you is, is that you don't necessarily go and do something good with the thought in mind that God's going to bless you abundantly because you do that. I don't think that's the right attitude. What Paul is talking about here is when you have the right attitude, this is the result. In the way that God intends to do it, which always isn't financially. It may be another way that you're not expecting it may be a character builder of some kind or another. I want to pause right here for just a minute. I, I want to, what, what do we have to do to make a difference today? See, the way I think is, is I think in terms of game plans, okay? You have to have some kind of a game plan. You, you have to have a plan. You have to have goals. Sometimes I think you even need to write them down. But number one of four points, all right, here's my game plan. I must begin with this idea of giving and loving and, and uh, my attitude towards others. I've got to begin by controlling my thoughts. We are a product of what we think, all right? Ladies and gentlemen, I'm telling you that we are driven by so many things today, from the media, from different types of, of sources that we listen to. My desire is to be happy and hopeful, so I will determine to have thoughts that are happy and hopeful. That's the first thing I want to do. I want to get my mind right. No matter what's going on in my life, I want to try my best to be happy and hopeful. I don't want to ever feel like I'm victimized by my circumstances. We don't want to be that way. I, I don't want to allow a petty inconveniences to master me. Okay? We, we don't like to think about this stuff, folks, and that's exactly why I'm talking to you about it. We don't like it. I'm not going to let petty inconveniences, stop lights, long lines. We went to those lights over there um, on Highway 45. And we had to sit in a line for a solid hour to go, go in, in figure eights around a parking lot and look at a bunch of lights, okay? And that just aggravated me. It just aggravated, flat out aggravated me. It just bothered me, you know. I just wanted to scream, to tell you the truth. All of us had to go to the bathroom, wasn't any facilities. You're in the car driving around. I mean, it, it just was a petty inconvenience. 
Houston traffic. I want a helicopter. Now, that's the stuff that's going through my mind all the time. How is it that you think that we come to be like that? Because we can't wait for anything. Wait on the Lord is what the scriptures teach. Negativism. Gossip. You're going to avoid that if, if your game plan is to control your thoughts. You're not going to act that way. You know what your companion is going to be? Your companion is going to be optimism. You're going to be optimistic. You're going to have something good to say about everybody, no matter how it is that they've treated you. This is, and if you do that, folks, you're going to have a victory. So number one I have how I want to make a difference in this world is I want to control my thoughts. Okay, now that's me. That's just Steve Garrett. I want to control my thoughts. Number two. I want to be grateful for the hours that are given to me today. And the older I get, listen to me, time is precious. Time is precious. And I think the apostle understood this very well, seeing as how he was in a prison about to get his head cut off. Okay? He understood that self-pity, anxiousness, boredom. Let me tell you about those things. They will pollute your mind. That's what they will do. I want you to understand. I want to wake up today and I want to be grateful for the challenges that I'm going to have to face. Then I want to do that with courage and I want to do it with joy. I, I want to look at every minute as though it's going to be my last. We don't look at things that way. Today will be gone tomorrow. Today is the beginning of what? The rest of my life, right? I've got today. I don't have tomorrow. Ain't a thing that I can do about yesterday. I can't do anything about that. I can't change anything. I might be able to go back to the person I offended now and ask forgiveness, but that's what you're doing today. So number two, I want, I want to want to want to be grateful for the time that God Almighty has given me. It's precious. Number three, Steve Garrett wants to make a, a difference every day. I want to make a difference every day. I want to make a difference with the people that work for me. I want to make a difference with my family. I want to make a difference with you. Do your past failures haunt you? I just got to get this out. Do they haunt you? Even though God Almighty has, has forgiven you of these things, does it just pop up in your head all the time and haunt you? Thank you very much, Daniel, uh, for the sermon this morning. Everyone's life's guys are filled with mistakes. Everybody, everybody, you know, it just seems like we drag ourselves through the trash all the time. Don't be that way. I'm trying not to be that way. I don't want to be that way. Look, you learn to confess, you learn to correct, and then you move on victoriously. And you look at it like that because after all, God Almighty, Jesus shed his blood for us so that we can do that. We're going to fail. Admit you failed. Turn away from it and go on victoriously. You're going to, what is it that, that, that the cowboys say? Cowboy up, right? Get up. Shake it off. That's what we used to say. Shake it off and move and do what we need to do. So that's the third thing, make a difference. And then the, the last, and for me, probably the most important, and the thing that I want to get across to all of you today, as we're talking about time and we're talking about giving and all of these things. I want you to understand that the time with your family, the time with your loved ones, the time with the family here in the church among us, but specifically moms and dads and grandmas and grandpas and aunts and uncles and all you family members, the time together, the time with your spouse. Don't make the mistake, you young married couples, that, you know, you need to uh, immerse yourself into, you know, 17 hours a day of work. What a waste. Put more trust in God. You work hard for the specified reasonable amount of time. You go spend time with the wife of your youth or with your children, which is so important. Listen to me. You can own the world. You can own the world and be poor for a lack of love. Absolutely poor. 
You can own nothing and be wealthy in your relationships. That's what I told you before, and I think it's important. And I think Paul is driving at this. So spend some quality time talking, hugging, thinking, listening. We'll, we'll do that, and you're going to be a whole lot better off. So much for my preaching. Now, number seven. In supporting Paul, the Philippians were supporting a missionary. What are the implications of this for you? They were supporting a missionary. Now, I didn't say what are the implications for the church. What are the implications for you? There is a concept in Scripture that talks about a sweet smell, a sweet aroma to God Almighty, pleases Him. You're, you're making an offering. And it's not so much uh, about the fact that you may do some great thing. Okay? So Noah, he offered up the burnt offerings on an altar, and the Lord smelled this sweet savor. It was sweet to him. It smelled good. I like uh, polo cologne. My wife says I've got way too much cologne. I mean, I do. I have a whole thing full, like, shelves of cologne. And I like to change it up. But my favorite one is that green polo. Y'all know what I'm talking about. Those men maybe in here who like cologne. I don't know. But I like that. My bottle's almost empty. Okay? And I told my wife, I've been telling, I've been hinting at this now for about the last two years. I'm getting down to the bottom. I need some polo. Or else I'm going to go buy it on Amazon myself. Okay? Birthday, Christmas. We done gone and passed two or three of them. All right. Look, that's a sweet smell. But if I've not got it to spray on my body, it ain't going to smell good. Okay? So the fact of the matter is, is that we have to do something, ladies and gentlemen. We have to make the offering. We have to drive to where it is that God Almighty would want us to do. That burnt offering, okay? needs to be sufficient. It doesn't need to be with a dead animal. Okay. This is important. And the same expression Jesus used, himself for us, an offering and a sacrifice to God for a sweet-smelling savor. A sweet-smelling savor. Ephesians uh, chapter 5, verse 2. So in God's eyes, the acceptableness of a sacrifice is measured by the spiritual condition of the person themselves. That's what it's measured by. Don't you see? Yeah. Michael. You just made me think of uh, Cain and Abel. Because, you know, like you read that. It, I mean, Hebrews gives you more explanation. But when you read it in Genesis, there, you... A lot of times, especially if it's like your first time reading, you're like, no, wait a minute. Why wasn't, you know, was, why was one sacrifice good and the other not good? And, you know, it seems like, you know, that's the best conclusion aside from, I mean, what we read in Hebrews, which talks about Abel's sacrifice being. Abel's sacrifice was better yeah. because Abel was obedient to right. God. The implication is, is, that is that Abel was obedient. Cain was not. And that, that goes with, with, with the point here. Paul knew that this offering came from an obedient heart. It was well-pleasing to God. He was doing that because, or he said that because he understood with what heart the Philippians sent that offering. And so what is the implication of that for you and for me? What will be a sweet-smelling savor? What is it that's Terry? Every time Terry preaches a sermon, what does Terry say? He says that, that our offering, our worship service, would be a sweet-smelling savor to, uh, uh, to the Lord. That's, that's so important. I want to get to number eight. Many people believe churches overemphasize giving. 
Is that a fair assessment? We're afraid. I'm telling you right now, we as gospel preachers and as uh, uh, elders, I think, I can't speak for them, but I can speak for me, I'm, I get a little tight talking to the congregation about money. Sometimes even when we need it, okay, I get a little worried about that, bothered by that. So I want to ask you, before we move on to nine, is that a fair assessment? I didn't write anything down there on purpose. Is it a fair assessment? What are your giving habits? I think John Albert hit on it just a little while ago. Do you give really from the heart? Are you given what, you, do you trust God that he can uh, uh, be able to take care of you if you give a little bit more and it hurts a little bit? Understanding the fact that we have a huge investment here in this congregation that, that has to be made in order to get a building that will be able to, to take care of the future generations of this congregation that has been growing. It is important, ladies and gentlemen, it, 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 it's not unfair to emphasize giving. I think it's a Bible concept. And I think Paul deals with it very well right here. And I'm telling you, if you're obedient to the Lord, you will give till it hurts a little. And you know the reason why you do that? Because you trust God. All right, what are your giving habits? Do you give regularly and generously? I'm just going to ask you, are you tight-fisted? Are you tight? My wife is tight, okay? Because when she goes to a grocery store, where's the first thing? And, and Ashlyn is too, okay? Because the first place they go at HEB or Walmart or wherever is to the what? Ow. The clearance. That's the first place they're going to go is to the clearance, and the funny thing about people like that is that they hoard stuff they don't even need. I'm going to pay for this when it's all over with. The problem is we think get, we think get, but not give. Now, aren't I right? Do we truly trust in God's goodness? Do we believe that his supply is infinite? Do we understand the fact that we are his children? Do you give to your children? You give way more than you ought to give. I'm telling you, you give till it hurts to your children. You have a problem with that one iota. You young married couples, I hope you're listening with your ears wide open. This is so important. This issue is about attitude. Is it a duty or a joy? Are you giving grudgingly? I mean, do you come up in here and when it's time to give, you know, you take a look at your wallet, you got a couple of 20s in there and a 10, and you say, hmm, I've got three or four ones too. I think I'm going to give that, that 10 and a few of those ones there. I'm going to get rid of that extra change in my pocket. Or do you grab that, that 20, that $40 and throw it in there? Or do you stop and think when you're organizing your finances, which I hope you are, in this day and time, and budgeting, not getting yourself in debt, do you stop and think, how much of this should I be giving to the Lord every week? And I'm going to set that money aside. And the time when I have an opportunity, I've gotten a raise or something like that, I'm going to take a look at that and I'm going to give a little bit more. All right? It's important. It's so very important. And don't think God Almighty can't see that. And if you give grudgingly, it's not going to come up as a sweet smell. I'm going to tell you, it's going to come. It's going to smell all right, but it's not going to smell sweet. Yeah, Albert. As mentioned earlier in my growth and development maturity, that, that giving in verse 8 and verse 9, I've been very fortunate that when it's talked about giving, yes, financial giving has always been discussed, but... Am I giving time for Bible study? Am I giving time for charitable work? Am I giving time, you know, so as you grow in your spiritual life, that, that giving is, has a whole different meaning in, other than just hearing about giving of money. That's right, Albert, and that's the reason why I talked about some of that stuff before I talked about the money. 
okay? Because it's really important psychologically to us, I think, in that, that regard. Number 10, how would you describe tithing uh, and giving from the heart to the... Uh, we can read these, but I want to read what Jesus says. Remember this, whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly. And whoever sows generously will also reap generously. Each of you should give what you have decided in your heart to give, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheer, cheerful giver. And God is able to bless you abundantly so that in all things, at all times, having all that you need, you will abound in every good work. The fact of the matter is we either believe what Jesus says in that regard or we don't. That's just the truth. Are we done? All right, guys. Thank you very much for this question.